Good evening, folks. The Angry History Chef here and uh, Spooky Doc Y. Hello. Um, this week's show is uh, just being done before we go to the training weekend for the Vite Society. So it's been about 18 months. Spooky Goth has been in London. She's just back from London. Yeah. That's been fun for her. Yeah, that's also been daunting and weird. So yes. it's like a whole week of daunting and weird things that we've not done for so, over a year. <laughs> yeah, so history. History is going to be an interesting one tonight. It's a bit of a potluck episode. Still early medieval. Um, I've got a lot playing in the top of my head. Um, we'll start with the easy subject. Uh, food. Early medieval food. And what is common dietary so normal. So normally, normally represented in reenactment by by grey wobbly bit stew, which well, is what I was condemned to for the first kind of few years of reenactment. It's like, oh, do you want authentic food? No. Uh, <laughs> and the thing is, no. Spooky, and the, and the spooky off wife started going out with me, and as people should be aware by now, <laughs> I am a retired chef from yes. the catering industry, and you don't need grey wibbly bot like wibbly bit stew, so to speak. Stew should be made lovingly and should go on the fire and take forever in the sense of you should be able to put it on. But a lot of the food of the period, and we'll come round to the authentic part now. I'm guessing mainly veggie. If you're no! Um, the vast majority of the food of the period is actually grains. It's yeah. cereal crop. But that's what I mean. You, you, you wouldn't get a lot of meat. If you were poor, well, it was no, that, no, no, because that's the problem. That's actually a feudalistic. It was medieval. Yeah, as in that's later medieval post conquest where yeah. meat becomes a thing because of nobility and everything else. In our period, people, general people, and again, this is going to be a social class thing, but your free person, even if they're not required by law to fight, for example, are still going to have access to meat. Hmm. It's going to be things like pigs, though. Rabbit. Well, not no, rabbit. rabbit is post conquest. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Well, allegedly, sorry. allegedly, rabbit Bad is post conquest. But I, 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 I have, I have my own reservations about that because the Romans brought rabbits over, and people said, "Oh no, because they died out, they didn't free them, they didn't whatever." If you've got rabbits, the easiest way to maintain a rabbit population for the purposes of feeding Roman citizens rabbit particularly the higher social classes. A very fine example is a, um, a rabbit fillet, or the, the thigh of the rabbit, stuffed with dormouse honey and something meat, like a like a, a weird meat pasty. It's like a Roman thing of, like, the, the ever, ever-present ever garum, plum, dormouse, stuffed into the thigh meat <sighs> of a rabbit. Who, what, who had the vendetta against the dormice? Like, I don't know. <laughs> they I don't did wrong. Know. But this is so, to back on point about the rabbit, as much as my spooky off wife just said rabbit, gone, oh no, post conquest. No, I have a thing that rabbits did exist. They just interbred with the hair. Well, I mean, you can't exactly have a Roman rabbit battery farm, can you? At that pit. Yeah, but it, like you said, it'd be easy to just. And they get out. Things naturally get out. Like, how many species are in different countries because somebody bought them over into a private collection and they got out. The grey squirrel is a fine example. Magpies. Oh, yes. Magpies. The, uh, the, the, the Blame Canada. Yeah. It's like, the only time really you'll ever hear me blame Canada. Um, and that's because the magpie is part of the yeah. Jay family um, to some degree. It is an it authentic is a... medieval child who yeah. used to have a styrofoam magpie that they do archery practice with. Yeah. Because magpies were not. Because magpies are evil. They'll kill, They'll like rip baby birds out of nests and kill them. They will. And as I was saying, um, as I said, it's a bit of a potluck, and we're talking about food and all sorts. <laughs> talking but about magpies. We're talking God about damn magpies. It. Yes. But no. Um, <laughs> so no, the vast majority of the food of this period is grain supplemented by meat. I'm not saying that they don't have vegetables, but the vegetables you're looking at are things like turnips, swede, parsnip, the ever-present rainbow carrots of purple. White, black, yeah, not orange. Seventeenth century Dutch, there, yeah. folks. Orange because it's Dutch. Don't ask me why. It's something to do with the Dutch, and they made orange carrots as some national mark. They I'm like guessing. orange. They love orange. Yeah. Um. Well, William of Orange. <laughs> yes. He was Dutch. Something to do with the Dutch. It, it's all to do with the Dutch. <laughs> when it's orange, when it's Dutch. orange, it's all down to the Dutch. I find. Um. But yeah, food of this period. Predominantly grain based, and it's weird because the grain 
as much as we say, oh, it's barley and this and, and spelt, and it's like, no, generally that it's we it's weird because it's all bread. It's either bread or beer, basically, or some form of bread-like substance, like a griddle cake or whatever else. And then vegetable-wise, it all seems to be about the leek and the onion, and it's probably because of flavouring. And the mm. lack of, to some degree, spices naturally. Well, yeah, because we're not, we're not. Because we don't really get spices until the Crusades. Yeah. And, you know, as much as the Vikings knew about Constantinople and all of that, mm. weirdly enough, a lot of your spices, and I mean your hot spices like pepper. Now I know to most people pepper is not a hot spice, but to a medieval taste, yeah, book, pepper is like off. whoa. It's too extreme. It is like sugar. Uh, I like the meme of like my life is blessed because I have experienced more extreme nacho flavor than any medieval peasant has done in their entire life. So, and you're not wrong. Perspective. Perspective. Now, <laughs> one of the things that is good, um, what you'll see is with barley, for example, a good recipe for barley is literally milk, barley, and leeks with butter mixed into it. So pan fry your leeks with some butter. Put your barley on to cook, drain your barley off a bit so it's all fluffed up, pour some milk in, put the leeks in and stir it and you basically, it's pottage. Yeah. But you know what? Serve with some pan fried pork, really nice meal. Mm. That's early medieval cuisine to some degree. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, whenever we did medieval reenactment, my auntie Val would always do a pottage and because I was the only pottage child. Great. Just porridge. It's my job to chop all the vegetables. Oh, good quality veggie <laughs> pottage. But this is the point. In our period, pottage, again, is a wonderfully quick, simple, staple food thing where you just lob it in a pan. Maybe this is your, like, celebrity cookbook. It's like Kieran's 101 Ways of Pottage. Could be interesting. I think Hugh Fernley <laughs> Wittenstall beat me to it, though, with oh, one of the River Cottage ones. he's old news. He's, he's, he's like, so uh, So what you're saying, what you're saying is, actually, if I win the lotteries, I should set up the Anglo-Saxon River Cottage. Yeah. And just do an early medieval farm cooking show. Yeah, with, 100%. Oh, that means I could get my pigs I've always wanted. I can yeah. get those Cheshire's. Or I can also get the Ironside Pretty, the Iron Age Anglo-Saxon style breeds, which are a mix of the Cheshire Red yeah. and Wild Boars. Mm. And they're like, they're smaller, but they're really bristly. Yes. Very nice looking pigs. See, this is why we need to set up a Patreon so that people can fund your Anglo-Saxon River Cottage. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but yeah, um, but the cuisine of the period is actually really interesting. If you can cook, you can do so much with period food. Yeah. You've got to remember, though, it's also, it's all seasonal. So you've got to know what your seasons are. And your meat season is September to March. Yeah. That's time immemorial. That's when you went hunting. Because everything had already bred to buggery. <laughs> well, not and, quite. <laughs> yeah. And then it had fattened itself up for winter. Yeah. So pigeon. Fine example. Pigeons. Do migrate, but they don't migrate. They're a, they go slightly warmer, but they don't completely yeah. disappear. Now, prime time to hunt pigeon, late August, early September. They'll have fed off all the fallen grain. They've got fat. They start going further south for nesting at times. But if you catch them just before they go more to, yeah. further, you get some really big pigeons. And I'm talking the size of a good quality chicken. That you could feed eight people off of. See, this is this is a question that I've just thought of. It, that you might not know the answer to. But in the Anglo-Saxon times, did they have like, oh, this is the king's forest, where only the king can hunt deer? Or... Yes and no. Because this is the yes. thing. Yes, there are royal estates where hunting game, yeah. in terms of large game, was punishable. Yeah. However... It is not the draconic... The Norman thing that you get. Where the king's ground or your lord's estate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there, there are laws to some degree and there are bits and pieces about what you can hunt, where you can hunt. And it's all down to whose land it is and everything else. But genuinely speaking, your big game is dangerous to hunt. So your average person isn't going to hunt it anyway. No, you're not going to want to try and take on a boar if you're like peasant. Even a, peasant a deer, scene. even a stag or a doe, to some degree, 
can be dangerous stunt. As much as the deer will flee most of the time, if you corner a fully grown male stag, oh yeah, those tines hurt. Yeah, <laughs> just ask anybody at Woolerton Hall who decides just, to just, get really close. I, I, I've, I've been close enough to a charging stag accidentally from surprising one to know to some degree what it's like to have a stag coming towards you with tines on its head. As much as they're not really designed for goring humans, yeah. they're normally designed for butting heads yeah, with yeah, other stags. Yeah. It's still a giant spiky rake thing coming to gut you. Yeah, it's like Lost Boys, it gets all impaled on it. Well, yeah, um, and the other <laughs> one, um, and the wild boar, again, you don't hunt wild boar by yourself. No, I mean, unless people, you're insane. Even people nowadays, like, you know, the Americans are like, I need my, my AK 47 for the 40 to 50 feral hogs. Oh, like, you know, what, but this is what I mean. It's that like even people now in the age of drone strikes don't really want to take on a ball. <laughs> if we look to the <laughs> outer lying regions of Chernobyl, Eastern Europe, Fukushima. and Northern Italy, and, and the Japanese hogs. Yeah, Princess and Mononoke happening in real life. I, I, there are numerous photographs out there, folks. Look up what a full grown male hog can reach. Okay, the slight added radiation in some aspects. <laughs> But northern Italy, because of Corona, and look at some of the size of the wild boar in the northwest of Italy and the sizes they've reached, and you will realise that that's kind of the size they could get at medieval times because oh, yeah. they're so hard to hunt. Yeah, and they had so much more forest and stuff to, to run round in and be happy little... Well, it's rural. Yeah. It's rural agricultural empire, yeah. aren't it? So it's not like they've got roadways and the habitats are there yeah. to some degree and they can roam more. They haven't got to try and get the across the M forty two or something. They're yeah. just kinda of like trotting about everywhere. Precisely. So like food in terms of meat, pig, chicken, cow, uh venison. Fish. Fish is a big one of course. Mm. The diet of the average British person going right back to Iron Age onwards. A lot of shellfish, a lot of freshwater fish, a lot of sea Saltwater fish there, yeah. that's my brain not working properly. Um, but I tell you what's a really nice one to do, bream. I don't think I've ever had bream. Bream, get a good size, or perch, good size, freshwater perch or bream. Literally, scale it, gut it, open it up, keep it whole. Yeah. Stuff it. Is it like a cod? Is it like a white fish? Or is it, it is white fish, it's a freshwater fish. Dish. Most yeah. freshwater fish is white, unless you're dealing with salmon or trout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So most of your low, slow river fish, bream, perch, tench, carp types of thing. Not a koi carp, I mean the proper yeah, English yeah, yeah, style yeah, carp. Yeah, like a brown carp. Yeah, like a brown carp. Uh, your river feeder, bottom feeders. Thing is, you can make carp really tasty. Because what you, but it takes a lot of effort, but it makes a really nice centrepiece. Again, shockingly enough, Hugh does yeah. this in the early series of River Cottage. Cat serves about a 10 kilo car puts it in a fresh water running bath where he's filtered he's got a fresh running stream by river cottage yeah he yeah diverts it slightly puts it in a bath and leaves the carp in it running through yeah. to filter out the body in the mud and it's a very nice very boring in some respects and requires the flavoring but it's just a white fish it's just fleshy white meat it's eat yeah but it's really nice apparently if carp done right but bream stuff it with um, sage, sorrel, and just pop it on a hot stone, cover it in yeah. um, like moss, and cook it while wrapped in leaves. You know what I mean? Like the usual steam it in the rocks type thing for so, fresh fire cooking. So this is my next question that you might or might not know the answer to. Yeah. So obviously we know not a great deal, because not a great deal kind of survived. We take How do we know what they were eating other than the fossilised poo? Midden heat. <laughs> We tend to find the midden heaps where food waste is. Mm. So with York, it's not just the nine on the thingy scale of the poo. <laughs> we also, there is... A, the foot long you, sub. You've got to remember that that poo was actually found in a midden heap. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. in that midden heap, there is a series of, throughout the dirt, there are particles and all sorts left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bones, animal bones and all sorts left over that we know. Yeah. So you, they found like a whole kernel. Of like wheat, yeah, that had been left in the, like that was so they carbon date it, mm. and we then know. Um, but yeah, vegetables for this period as well. Mm. Come back around a bit. Um, leeks, 
uh, leeks, onions, lots of the allial family. Yeah. They're massively into garlic and wild oh, garlic yeah. and onions and leeks and everything else. And I'm like, cool, that's fine. I'm, I'm all for it. And they also must have had incredibly good immune systems with the amount of onions and leeks and stuff they must have been eating. That's why there's no, like, British vampire stories until a lot later, because that's the only thing you've got to flavour anything. Literally, <laughs> it's just it is. It's just like, like it. half of the recipes you look up, particularly in like the Anglo-Saxon leechcraft books. Well, yeah, because garlic should be yeah. purifier, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. this is the whole thing. The whole allial family is all about like purifying the blood. It's like you eat leek, it's good for the digestive tract in your blood. Eat garlic, good for the digestive tract in your blood. Unless you're me. Yeah, in which case Kieran's kind of not allergic but intolerant. To I'm it. quite intolerant of garlic in excess. I can eat a small quantity, and I can eat quite a few leeks, I can eat onions all right, but garlic, because it's so concentrated, I'll eat it, but I will then have an awful stomach upset for a couple of days. He reminds me of the guy, this is going to be such a niche reference, out of Box Trolls, who's allergic to cheese, and he swells up and then blows up. I yes. feel like that would be you. And garlic, because I love Eating garlic, garlic bread. Bread. Well, the, the, the big issue is, of course, from my love of garlic and white Anglo-Saxon cuisine, and Viking cuisine to some degree is always appealing, is because of all the onions, garlic and everything in it. And that's also because of my big fondness for Roman and Italian cooking. Yeah. And bring me the pasta, bring me the massive quantities of sauce, go sparing on the meat at times, because yeah. I'm not that bothered. I will quite happily just eat a giant bowl of pasta and sauce on the top and be done. Oh. Not even with cheese on. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> all for the proper poorest Italian, poor person Italian, where it's yeah. just pasta and sauce and that's it. The thing that always makes me laugh I think is how nowadays it's like the the brown like the brown bread with all the chunks of things in it and the seeds and like the darker the bread the healthier it is and then like in in the olden times it was like oh the I'm, white the bread I'm, the posh yeah it is. I'm so rich like look at my white white processed bread and now it's like I'm so rich look at my organic wholemeal rye bread it's sourdough a joke, isn't it? but it's because it's, it's cheaper be. it's because it's cheaper nowadays to oh yeah to get all the bits of millstone out of it yeah <laughs> it's like it's because you're milling on an industrial scale where it's not millstones it's bloody beautiful metal rollers that crush it and they vary in size and scale yeah, and they yeah. vibrate as well to Ooh. loosen all the chaff and everything so they've not got a it's Industrial bread production is ridiculously interesting in the modern world. I can tell you that. <laughs> That's the headline to take, take away. away. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm a man who loves his bread. You I do. am a big carb hun. Um, well, no, you, you are the fault. Well, I don't know. Like, did Kieran cause the dog to get addicted to carbs, or was the dog addicted to carbs before he well, got and to potatoes. us? Well, potatoes. This is the issue. We don't know his origin story. He was called Spud at the shelter. And I just have this image of like the cardboard box with the stick trap. And there's just a potato in it. A baked potato. And that's how they caught him. Oh. You see, that would work on me as well. <laughs> a loaf of bread or a, potato, a baked potato under a box with a stick. And it would catch me probably as well. Because I'd be like, oh, loaf of bread. Or oh, oh, potato. And this is on food. I'm on track. Um, at the at the drinks thing. Yes, after while you're the, in after the London, meeting thing, you're in London, yes. They're coming round with little trays of nibbly things. Oh. Um, and they had tiny Yorkshire pudding stuffed with yes. a little bit of horseradish, yeah. roast beef, mashed yes. potato as a. No, no, no. Just the just the. Oh, the you've got a mashed put potato the quid- and then the, roast beef because we all thought oh. it was horseradish, and I was like, oh. No, no, you should you should hide. If you're doing them properly, you hide a tiny bit of horseradish under the mash. Yeah. Right, so you do your horseradish. Oh, you put your mash, yeah. So you bite into thinking it's mash and beef, and you get the kick of the horseradish. Or oh, miniature Yorkshire pudding stuffed well, with mashed roast beef and horseradish. Bro. I was bragging. Fucking gorgeous. I was bragging to all the southerners of like, my husband makes Yorkshire puddings as big as a wheel. He does. <laughs> and he fills them with roast dinner. And that's just for himself. Yes. Everyone else can go hang. And then you have a second Yorkshire pudding for a dessert. pudding with marmalade. <laughs> it should traditionally be jam or maybe golden syrup, but I am a marmalade fiend yeah. in the true style of Paddington. There you go. Uh, early medieval desserts. Was it just Egg fruit? custard. Oh. Egg custard tart. Oh, well. Like your pastry, egg custard, See, like a sweet curd, yeah. basically. We um, had um, a Living History Day where we kind of theorised that we could work out how to do a Viking cheesecake. 
if the temperatures were cold enough to set it. I'm not quite sure how you do a Viking oats. cheesecake. Oats. You do the base out of like oats and honey. You could make biscuits anyway, do you? Well, there You've we go. You've got flour and butter yeah. and, and milk. You can make biscuits. Yeah. So there we go. Cheesecake. Mm, I suppose so. We don't know they didn't have it. No, but um, yeah, egg like an egg custard tart yeah. is a common dessert. Normally flavoured with things, though, and I will warn people here if they go to a tent this, half the time they use tansy. What the hell's that? It's a flower. I know it's a flower, but... Um, it's sweet. It's often used in a lot of medieval recipes for cooking. Yeah. Okay, but this is an actual health warning. Oh. It is lethal in certain quantities. Oh. And you can trip your tits on it with the right quantities <laughs> from eating it. Um, oh. Sue Perkins and Giles Corran. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They used to do their food that. things. Yeah. They did a medieval one, and she really fell in love with the egg custard tarts that were flavoured mm. with tansy, which wasn't med, which was an Anglo-Saxon recipe from the eleventh century. Yeah, and she realised she was high as a kite. <laughs> Because she'd had that much tansy, because she'd eaten that, because they'd been yeah, made of yeah, that yeah, one, yeah. and she'd been warned only to have two or three, and she'd just eaten about eight, Yeah. and she was then tripping her tits off. Oh, God. Well, I don't like egg custard, so I'd be Well, okay. no, I say egg custard. It's kind of a mix between egg custard and a cheesecake. Mm. Like a baked cheesecake Ooh. is what you're looking Ooh. at there. So it's not a full egg custard, but it's not quite a cheesecake. It's yeah. kind of something in between. Yeah. I've got recipes upstairs for it. Oh, we could make could, it for a show. You could do like strawberries and cream as well, I guess. You, you could do, cream. you could technically make meringue in theory. Egg whites, whisk them up, milk, poached meringues. In theory would be possible. But you had, they only had bread ovens, didn't they? Or did they not even have bread ovens? I don't know what the... I know absolutely nothing about cooking um, in this I time period. I genuinely speaking, I take a good dose of Roman history, I take yeah. a good dose of later medieval history, and I kind of mash it together, and that's what I base a lot of my cooking off of. Yeah. So I treat bread ovens as bread ovens, Romans had bread ovens, later medieval had bread ovens. Sorry to the rest of the authenticity department and everything else saying... Just because it happened before and it happens after doesn't mean it might happen to that. Bollocks to the lot of you and get <laughs> out my kitchen. If I'm cooking and I know that the Romans have bread ovens and the later medieval period have bread ovens, why wouldn't anyone else have fucking bread ovens? <laughs> and they and the ruins of like Rome. Well, they were no, really ruins. We have ruins were... of actual early medieval kitchens yeah. where we know there is an oven and a stove yeah. and everything else. There are proper kitchens, yeah. but trying to do that in a field sometimes well, yeah, you can't. is very difficult. You can't. But there is nothing to dictate that someone didn't think about taking egg whites and putting it in milk to make fluffy little crunchy meringues. Okay. Oh, I was just imagining like King Alfred sat yeah. with his no, meringues. I'm, I'm talking high level here. I'm not talking Win- your day to day common Winchester mess. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the Winchester mess deer is normally when the rifles rock up after they've had a parade <laughs> through the city. Uh, <sighs> um, yes, but no. High-level cuisine in terms of royalty, senior-ranking nobility, yeah. who might have professional chefs that they maintain yeah, yeah. on estates. I don't see why things like meringues couldn't be cooked up. Yeah, Everything is there in the period, in theory, to cook a meringue in terms of like milk poached meringues. Yeah. They are a thing. We used to I bet make the Vikings them. have loved meringues. Right, okay. <gasps> you can make a meringue long ship. No, because you would require it. Poached meringues do just come out of little... Um, you literally just spoon them into the milk, poach them in milk to cook them. That's a prog rock name. Meringue long ship. There we go. Um, <laughs> but there's enough... But like you could flavour the egg... Yeah, you could put a bit of honey in with the egg whites, flavour it with honey, sweeten up the meringue. Yeah. And like... I've for some reason become fixated on meringues and it's probably because I'm just <laughs> craving meringue at the moment. I'm probably just craving like chewy you make meringue. One after. I could yeah. make some meringue later, yeah. Meringue long ship. Yeah. Meringue well, long ship. Well, I might make some meringue tomorrow. Yeah. So I might do a bit of early medieval cooking on Friday for the weekend to save time. I have another question. Yeah. Which is, well, it's not a question. I think it's more like ask Kira, ask Angry History Show. Yes, yes, ask Kira, which the Angry is, History Show. I think right. f- 
from my perspective, and I think a lot of other people's perspectives, cook the idea of cooking in a cauldron is for some reason terrifying. It's no different to your slow cooker at home, folks. This is this is the thing that I think. Having... No different to your slow cooker at home, folks. Yeah. Cauldron. As long as you've got a lid for a cauldron, whichever way you want to do it. As long as you've got a lid for a cauldron, and you know how to use. Now, the biggest scary part, of people, is not the cauldron itself. The fire. It's the fire. Yeah, because you can't keep a people, constant. People. The problem is people don't know how to judge. Yeah. Open log fires. Yes. And to some degree. Having worked in kitchens and the ranges I used to work with, which are huge gas burning ones, mm. which have the solid metal top plate and the heat disperses across. So you can lift the rings out and have direct heat, but you can put the rings back on and it then disperses the heat yeah, out. So yeah, you can have yeah, pans yeah. at different points. That's actually what cooking on an open log fire is like for me. It's like working in an actual kitchen because different points in the firebox have different heats, which mm. means I've got. When I work on the firebox, I have my metal tongs, that I, well, my metal scraper thing, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I move the fire around to give me my working surface yeah. with my trivets, so I've got direct heat, I've got warming coals, I've got a warm section to let things cool down, but not go cold, so mm. it lowers them, so if I need to bring them up, I can drag a few coals around it and bring it back up to temperature on the trivet, yeah. and then overhanging. This is why I'm looking at wanting to get a new set, I mean... Adam Blue Axe Productions uh, reproduction stuff. He's yeah. got a beautiful cooking range yeah. that I need to show you after we've recorded this. Yeah, we're not sponsored. We're if, not. Sponsored. If you would like to sponsor, we're us. not sponsored by anyone. This is me just like <laughs> follow. I follow a lot of people on Facebook, and the one social media I tend to do a lot of is Facebook with the odd bit of Instagram, and I follow a lot of. Now my Facebook's very boring. It literally is made up of reenactment reproduction com- like companies that make stuff for reenactment and yeah. historical equipment and miniatures yeah that's it that's my facebook page it's true folks. it's true um i don't really do much else in life i literally spend my time between history books and miniatures yeah and reenactment is like the outcome along with the war game yeah. <laughs> it's when you get to be a miniature yeah oh well, i've done that as well that's from the baron's you war do, yes. i am but yeah some people out there have, have got a kira they've got an they've got angry history there's about chef six merch. there is about 600 of me out in oh the god. world oh god there is probably about 600 well, 550 ish i think but there's about 550 600 of me out there in the world um if you go to the baron's war page on Again, Facebook. we're not sponsored. But... You will see <laughs> pictures of me in um, late 12th, early century war gear with the two-handed axe. I was a uh, 24-hour exclusive miniature. You were. You were. You were um, hot property. There is a miniature of the spooky goth wife with there a is. frying pan. And I do even have a witch's hat. Hat on, yes. <laughs> Just like, it's like I'm getting you sculpted with a witch's hat because that's what's in the picture. The best picture of you of your wimple on is where you've got a witch's hat on. And I was like, Okay, but I've got a frying pan, so I'm like serving Tiffany aching realness. Yes. Um, for all you Discworld people. Yes. So and yes. It's uh, not. Yeah, you still need to paint me. I, well, yeah, but there's ten of you to paint. Paint me, paint me like one of your. Oh, you don't paint your miniatures, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> ooh, <laughs> ooh, that's a fucking low blow. For that, I might just quickly dip what shade you now. I'll just like the shade. I'll just shade you. <laughs> You're not getting painted, you're just being shaved. <laughs> Get some strong tone shadal work going and just dip you instead and be like, there we go, you're painted now with all the shade. <laughs> oh, blimey. That, in fairness, like, you showed me a meme that basically that basically called up all these miniature painters out. Yes. With your grey armies. Yes, <laughs> but not all my armies are grey. No, you have done very and well. And I also have a lot more miniatures than one man could technically paint in a lifetime. Yes, but that's... When that's your hand kind of... doesn't work properly at painting at no. times, it goes off it, flails, ruining ten hours of work. Yeah, but at the same time, I think my impression of most people with miniatures is that they have more miniatures than they can possibly paint. Correct. Because... And that if you had painted all of them, you'd start having heart palpitations. No, you just end up going, well, what do I do now? Yeah. And then you end up with more projects. And if you manage to successfully paint all of them, you'd be concerned because you're like, good Lord. What's wrong with you? Yeah, um, I just enjoy miniatures and building them. 
and stuff. I, I find painting a chore, but we've completely gone off track there. Yes. So let's go back to food um, <laughs> and the medieval period and cuisine in the medieval period. And bread, Yeah, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Mm. The, the flip roll of white bread being all common as muck now and all the yeah, fancy brown yeah. breads being like, ooh. When the reality is actually somewhere about, really, if you wanted an accurate bread in some respects, you want to look at the best of both. <laughs> it's whack a loaf of hovis down yeah. in LH. <laughs> well, because of the way milling works in yeah. terms of millstones and doing that, to go from white flour to brown flour is quite difficult with the sifting and everything else yeah so what you end up with sometimes is more just kind of a mix of it's just a very very fine like it is sifted but what you end up with is kind of a very very fine white flour but it's not white if yeah. you get what i mean it's beige it, yeah it, yeah well you get a white a color tote. when it's cooked it is got a white hue to it yeah but it, it would be like the sheer level of required to get proper white flour. This is why true white flour is reserved for the aristocracy. Yeah. And I mean the really high ranked this aristocracy. This is the thing. It's like if you if you have one of these time travel comedies where you've zapped somebody from the early medieval period into into now. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you just take them out somewhere with a free bread basket and they'd just be like, oh, oh, oh. like just, just eating the little, the little cobs. tiny white, <laughs> yeah. tiny white immaculate cobs, and they'd be like, "Are oh, you all royal?" And the salt, the salt and pepper shakers, like, "Oh, you have taken me to a banquet." <laughs> yeah, and it's like, no, this is just day to day life. This so. is just what's on the table. <laughs> oh, I There's a wonderful meme out there that, well, not meme. I think it was a Twitter feed, something social media based, where someone basically lists all the herbs and spices in their cupboard, and it's like my medieval ancestors had barely a quarter of this in their entire lifetime. Yeah. It's like, in one cupboard, I have more herbs and spices than certain medieval people would see in their entire life. Yeah, I don't think they would have really known about cardamom pod. Cardamom's come through with the Crusades later. Crusades. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. 14th, like, 15th yeah, century, yeah, you get yeah. cardamom. Yeah. Um, you start getting it in Italian cuisine in the 15th century because it's that sweet flavour. You get um, the certain dessert, like milk dessert, like... Um, and about vanilla, vanilla being the boring flavour. Oh when my it's god! Such a pain in the ass. To vanilla like... is the biggest. Anyone who ever tells you vanilla is plain and boring needs to go and get in the fucking sea. <laughs> vanilla <laughs> is one of the hardest flavours to grow. Like as an actual thing, it is so labour intensive, yeah. and yet it has become because of synthetic vanilla flavour. Yeah. Yeah. It's like... But it's not. Vanilla, as it is, and I'm sorry if you think you're a boring ass bitch because you <laughs> like vanilla. Sorry, I love vanilla as a flavour. You do. I love True. vanilla. And anyone who thinks it's boring and plain needs to go out and get an education on cuisine and learns where things come from. The two greatest flavours in the world, vanilla and saffron. Yeah. And vanilla, folks, real vanilla, costs almost the same as saffron yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not your shitty vanilla extract flavouring from Sainsbury's. Not your crappy vanilla... Well, there's a difference like... between essence and extract, isn't there? Yes. But everyone tends to have vanilla essence, okay? Which is synthetic vanilla. Vanilla extract is the byproduct of making vanilla paste and everything else. And having fresh vanilla properly can be so expensive depending on the variety of yeah, vanilla yeah, it is. Because yeah. vanilla isn't just one single thing either. No. There's about eight different varieties of vanilla yeah. out there. So, yeah, that's a big one that always bugs me about cuisine. When everyone goes, oh, it's just got vanilla as a flavouring in medieval cuisine. I'm like, do you understand how, like, astronomically expensive vanilla is? Particularly yeah. in the 16th and 17th century. Particularly the 17th century when, because if I remember it, vanilla's a, I believe it's South American. <laughs> Not a clue. Same with cocoa. Not a clue. Um, oh, good news for all those out there. We do have those of you who are coffee drink um, in the outside world. Those of you who drink the, the abominable coffee. I say abominable. I lie. <laughs> I'm always fond of a good Turkish you, you coffee. You like it. You I like sludge. Like... Yeah. You... <laughs> I drink Turkish coffee, folks. So I tend to just drink sludge that you have a small glass of ice cold water with. And a Turkish delight you put in it to actually make it palatable. Basically the porter of the hot beverage world. Yes. 
I know how you work. The more bitter it is and the darker something is, black. the happier. I like things black. Yes. <laughs> you Coffee, the palest, palest of things. The palest but your soul, bitch. darling, your soul is so black. I do wear a lot of black, in fairness. So your I guess... soul is black, darling, at times. I yes. can live with that. Um, but yeah, no. Coffee. For those of you in the early medieval world out there listening to this, the, the, the mighty chicory. Mm. The mighty, mighty chicory plant. We do have finds of it. Where? Now I need to remember which <laughs> you one. You can't just be like, we found no, it. No, no, no. In the early medieval meal, so in an early meal, yeah. the book, of, and then yeah, yeah, the yeah. medieval, this is the Oxford University Press, the archaeology, history and archaeology yeah, series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They do one called Medieval Food. Both of them discuss um, chicory. There's two, I think. One's from Norway and the other is York. Mm. And there are remains of chicory. So I'm not saying you could have coffee, but there is grounds for a coffee substitute <laughs> in the... Because cheap coffee's made from chicory. Yeah. So that's the whole point. Hence why in our D&D came, Connor is desperately trying, bless him, yes. him and Will... To set up the um, bard books. books. Yeah, their coffee shop, but it's made using chicory. Yeah. Because chicory is, shockingly enough, I will dig it out for anyone interested. And if you're at the training weekend and you see me, I will have some of my books with me. Yeah. I'll have my food books with me and other bits. Um, so if anyone wants to come and bother me at the training weekend, feel free to. Because you do like being bothered in I that do, way. I do like being bothered that way. Just not on Friday night, because we're hopefully maybe going to be playing D&D Friday night. In Nerd Law. In Nerd Law. Under the new <laughs> awning. Under the new awning. Oh, around the table. I hope it doesn't rain. I, I know it will. We've got a firebox, oh dear. We've got the new <laughs> awning. Hopefully it'll be set up. Oh. And we can have our D&D game on fri- Friday night, all being well. Yeah. If it works. Or yeah. they're just going to be all of us sat in our tent. Doing it with the dog, with the dog on the camp bed <laughs> as as the table, which would just be like a normal oh, Friday night in some respect. Chicory does exist. There are finds. I'll dig them out. I'll have a look for people. I'll put it into the Facebook comment section where they're from. Yeah, but then you're opening the doorway of having everybody in LH walking around with mugs of coffee, and that not be some sort of diplomatic no. incident. No, 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 because chicory is chicory. Chicory is not coffee. Coffee and chicory are two completely different, They're different things. different colours. I've got no clue. Right. Coffee, you make synthetic fake coffee, as I call it, yeah. out of chicory. Oh. Okay. So all the crappy instant coffee yeah, stuff yeah, you get, yeah. half the time isn't made from coffee beans. It's made from chicory roots. Ah. I didn't know that. Like the cheap... I'm not talking Nescafe, <laughs> all, but you, you know your cheap, and yeah, I mean yeah, your yeah, cheap, yeah. The fruit, nasty, freeze dry kind yeah, of half the time the block. ridiculously stupid, cheap, cheap coffee, <laughs> right, is made of chicory roots, not mm. coffee. And the thing is, if you can stomach the, the sheer crap that is chicory-based <laughs> coffee, then I, I am not going to hold it against you if you've got chicory roots and you're grinding them up to make a hot beverage. I'm not saying you can use instant coffee in LH, by the way. That is not what I'm forgiving. What I'm saying is if you come with chicory roots and you pestle and mortar them up and put them into hot water and add milk, I'm not going to dispute that because we have chicory root pies. Yeah. At which okay. point you put it. the effort in to grind chicory roots yourself to make your own coffee at a show. Yeah. That's fucking dedication. I'm not sure about the adding the milk, but... Well, we don't know. We don't maybe, know. Maybe a runic tablet. Be- bear in come mind, out. bearing in mind that this weekend I may just be making cups of schloop for myself <laughs> in the morning by just taking condensed uh, milk, hot water, I think and tea I've got leaves. Some and spare just... condensed milk. You have stuff. done. I've already checked. I'll be taking. <laughs> t- I'll be taking a tin of condensed milk and literally a small pan, putting it on the trivet, putting my condensed milk in my water, and lob my tea leaves in, and just mm. let it warm up, and then just like. Leave it to settle on the side and then just dunk my mug in and yeah. drink sloop all morning. Because to hell with you all, I'm having sugary hell tea. Cause sugary hell tea? Yeah. <laughs> because sloop isn't always the greatest. Cause it's I got don't tea need leaves clear in. arteries. No, 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 I don't. <laughs> I, was, I was reading FUD and it made me laugh because Vimes gets horrified when Sybil cleans the uh, tea Teapot, yes, yeah. yes. And I was like, oh my God, we really are Vimes and Sybil. <laughs> I just don't like BLTs. No, 
I'm not a big fan of bacon. No, problem. you're not. I prefer a nice, like, slide of actual pork. Mm. BLT for me is basically pork chop with the lettuce and the tomato rather than... I can't a, stand like, pork chops. There's so much effort for so little reward. Yeah, it's pork cutlet. The pork chop itself doesn't have... A pork chop itself doesn't have the bone. You know, just, you know but, yeah. me and pork, anyway. Yeah, even though it's like one of the best meats out there. Um, but yeah, food and the training weekend to some degree yeah. and what we're doing. Um, I'm literally doing pork mince balls with pan-fried leeks and some root vegetables as a mash. Or as a stew, I'm not sure yet what I'm going to do, but I'm intending to knock something up for the training weekend. Um, In fairness, you made a real... I mean, it's not authentic, but you made that chicken curry really well in the cauldron. Yes. And I would never even think... I mean, I just... I have this, like I said, but I have curry, this mental but block this is the with thing, cauldron. Curry, <laughs> curry is basically Indian stew. Yeah. Like, from that part... From the sub Hindu Kush, whatever downwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. Curry. I, I don't think sometimes people realise that curry really is just like the Indian format. It had more spices available. <laughs> yeah, well, theirs isn't like thyme, sage, rosemary. Theirs is turmeric, cumin, coriander, um, cardamom, and everything else. And instead of like gravies. They use, like, yoghurt from the goat and everything. And you know what I mean? They, But, yeah, curry, to some degree, is really just... Yeah, the Vikings have had yoghurt, haven't they? Yeah. 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 In theory, I could make a Viking period curry. I could just call it Byzantine curry. Yeah. With all the flavours I could get access to in in Constantinople, which is apparently Istanbul now, but... (laughs) <laughs> that's nobody's business but the Turks it is nobody's business but the Turks but yes, but yeah in theory if I had access to what was available in in Constantinople as the spice trade industry as Varangian Guard might be and I decided to bring something back to wherever in theory you could make curry because you'd have been making curry or serving curry like substances in Probably Constantinople to some degree because of all the influences of it. Um, the Roman, the, 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 there's mention of a Romans having like down in in um, the flesh pots of Syria. <laughs> Where's, where have you got that from? That Roman phrase. Hi- it's Roman history, darling. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll. It, it's to do with food, but it's also there's, to there's do pots with... of flesh. It's to do with cooking. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, twenty second legion. Okay, yeah. is normally the Egyptian legion. Right. Right. The Egyptian legions are seen as a really cushy job. Right. Right next door to Egypt was Syria. Okay. Yeah. And the Syrian Empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, the thing is, the border, to, or, or Syria itself, was owned by the Romans. You've got Egypt there, but the legions were the outposts in the major Syrian settlements. Yeah. To control Syria from the Parthen and Parthid Empire and yeah. so forth and so forth. Apparently, according to Roman writing, the best whores in the entire empire yeah. were in Syria. So there is often a thing that legionaries in the 22nd legion, if you've got a posting at the 22nd legion, yeah. wild away their days, wasting time in what they call the flesh pots of Syria. And flesh pots is a slang term for a brothel. I thought it was like a sauna. No, it it it's a slang term for a brothel. Yeah. But it sounds so much better in Latin. <laughs> but I always use just the modern vernacular yeah. of it. So I always refer to the flesh pots of Syria. I know you do. You have been a lot. I actually care if no, they're in don't. a flaunting. You really don't. I'm normally quite happy if all and sundry wandering around. Bloke or woman, wander around whatever makes you happy. Yeah. I really don't care. It's true. Kieran would be sat there in a strip club with a pint of stout, a pipe, and he'd be reading some history book and a bra would hit him in the face and he'd just be like, just get rid of the bra and then carry on reading I'd be more, dis- more annoyed because I've been disturbed by something getting me in the face while I'm trying to read. Yeah. yeah. In FUD, the yeah. phrase two sequins and a bootlace came up and I started laughing on the train because it just reminds me of you now. <laughs> it's such a good, Im- such good imagery. Two sequins and a bootlace. Yeah. <laughs> That would be that would be a good like drag club name. Two sequins and a bootleg. Yeah. yeah. There's um, well the problem is is for me it's that thing of and um, we're just gonna as I said I don't know where tonight's talk's gonna go. 
<laughs> it's been a hot, long week. I've done a lot of prep work for a training weekend. Yeah. And I'm just blowing off steam with a history talk and a random chat as well, to some degree. It was, it could have been anything that yeah. we'd really talked about today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, two sequins and a bootlace. And <laughs> that phrase is generally one I use because it amuses me because it's accurate to what Do most you, strippers wear. Is it a Terry Pratchett thing you picked up or is it a, a policeman thing? Because then obviously you've got, I don't know where you've got it from. It is a copper's phrase. Yeah. And Pratchett, when he wrote about the watch, he knew a lot of old school coppers. Yeah. And there are numerous, my, my grandfather's used phrase, she was uh, caught wearing pretty much nothing but two sequins and a bootlace <laughs> while legging it down the high street. <laughs> um, and that's from back, that's about 1971 <laughs> when they raided what was allegedly a strip club yeah. that was the cover for a brothel. Yeah. That's fair. So that it, is it, the time it, it, to it be. Is, yeah. yeah. So it is an old school copper's phrase: two sequins and a bootlace to some degree. <laughs> it's true. In, in terms make of that re- the title of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of referring to ladies of negotiable affection in some respects, but more exotic dancers, so yeah, to yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, and like burlesque, it like no, they've got pasties on, which are more than sequins. They are sequined. But they're normally much more substantial than a sequin. See, bringing it back to food, yes. when pasties first started to become a thing, I was on the internet and kept reading them as pasties. Well, I would love to see a woman <laughs> do a burlesque routine with a pair of Cornish pasties on her boobs. They did that on two pints of lager. Oh, with, um, yeah, Sheridan Smith. Yeah. Yes. Because Johnny was obsessed with... Um, Cornish pasties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. It's an image that sticks in your head for a long time, dear, with Sheridan Smith and two Cornish pasties. <laughs> it's already been done. Yeah, it's already been done. You could do it as a homage. A homage. But food like <laughs> Nanny Og says, Nanny Og, it's a bit of a Discord one as well, yeah. Nanny Og always says food is the way to a man's heart, which shows you that anyone talking about romance has no idea of human anatomy, because <laughs> the quickest way to a man's heart is through the rib cage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, food should be... And this brings us actually very nicely into a segue onto uh, foods of the arousing nature and aphrodisiac in the food world in the early medieval period. See, I know about um, the Romans being big, but I don't know about... Guess what? It's always oysters. It's oysters Uh, as far as the eye can... No, it's because of the amino acids I in it. Know. Whereas if I was to have oysters for the... Uh, You'd die. I'd die. <laughs> Not really anything aphrodisiacal about the I don't know. Yeah. There, there might be for some people. Well, yes, yes. So, don't kink shame, Kira. I'm not kink shaming anyone. Anyway. But yeah, no, there is aphrodisiacal... I think that's a word. <laughs> but th- there are aphrodisiacs in the early medieval and medieval period um, that aren't just Well, everybody needed oysters. a bit of help sometimes, didn't they? Um... Strawberries awesome. used to always be one. That's actually a later period. Apples in Greece. Really? Yeah, it, I've been listening to a podcast about Sappho, and Sappho is obviously very intertwined with Aphrodite, and Aphrodite, uh, one of the symbols was apples. Is it a golden apple? No, but that's one of the things yeah. obviously related to. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, Because apples. in Persian thing, the uh, immortals are known as the apple bearers. Yeah. And the apple bearers were part of the corsagic style routine yeah, of yeah, the yeah. high kings of Persia. And apples had something to do with the concubines and everything else. Well, and there was the... always apples the old... Apples seem to be a weird one, yeah. There was always the old folklore spell about But I think this is term. why the Bible ends up making the forbidden fruit apple. Probably. Because it's actually the ancient world doing it. Yeah, they because the lady that was talking about it was talking about there was an ancient Iranian or Sumerian. Well, that'd be like Sumerian well, Iranian poet. would be like Persian. She was the first. So. She was the first known uh, poetess. All right. Um, like in history. Yeah. I think it's called, I'm going to mispronounce it. It's like Ehedjuana or something. Okay. She was linked to Ishtar and Iana, okay, like the well, goddess Ishtar, of love and the well, goddess of the moon. Well, Ishtar, of course eventually corrupts into Esper yeah, yeah, and yeah. becomes the Easter goddess, of course, of sex and but rabbits. They were, and they were saying that a lot of early Christian stuff comes from that kind of neck of the woods as well. Yeah, well, it does. Christianity stems from the East. everything's just copying off something else. I mean, well, that's what I liked about 
the Greeks, in some respects, and the kind of polytheistic thing is that they just kind of like went, yeah, we'll have a bit of that. Oh, we like them. We'll adopt them. We'll change the name of it to make it easier to pronounce. And well, then like, we'll just like, like in the last episode in. I was on about the Romans. Yeah. And they just went, that god's like our god. We'll yeah. build a temple to both at once and we'll tap the Roman name god yeah. with the other name god and eventually push out the old god and just leave the Roman god. Because yeah. three generations down the line of yeah. people, you're suddenly just worshipping like Jupiter yeah. or like, Mars like or Opal Minerva. Fruits. Opal fruits and Starburst. We're going to be like the last generation that remember opal fruits. Good lord. <laughs> it's a bombshell. Good lord. You know what I mean, though? They replaced it and now... Well, it's like marathons and Snickers. Yeah, exactly. And even less people are going to remember that now as well. Yeah, because that was before technically even our time. Well, yeah, because my mum told me about that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I only know about marathons and Snickers because I love history. Facts. I know. And I know. Random knowledge is useful. There you go. Oh, so... my God. We could... You, I could write a pub quiz for, like, the Billy or Annie's or something yeah. with some proper obscure questions that a bunch of, like, below the age of 30-odds wouldn't even know. Well, maybe maybe you should pose some questions <laughs> to the podcast well, audience. Yeah. Well, there are questions to the podcast audience of, like, is there anything you really are desperate to know about? Yeah, please tell us, because otherwise we'll just keep talking about drag queens and, and strippers. History and, and all sorts. The history um, of apples. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're, we're going to come round to feasting, shockingly enough. Coming back round. Well, come round it's again like the magic roundabout. <laughs> That's how it works in my head. Tangents upon tangents. It's like a giant spoked wheel I don't believe. I don't believe that. That's too organised. I never said the spokes were straight. I was going to say it's like a four-dimensional spoked wheel. Yes. <laughs> to be honest here, think of it as actually like a dwarven stronghold with lots of mine shafts all over the place. And yeah. Like. It's very much but in a pyramid. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. Mm. Uh, but feasting. Yeah. Um, Yule. Yes, it happens. Because it's you have, like days. you said, you have, to get, you have to slaughter all the animals. Yeah, which is the whole point of Yule. Yeah, yeah before Yule, the winter. Yeah, and the thing is with Yule, and also with Christmas, particularly medieval Christmas, um, it was about celebrating the year. Yeah, you, you survived. Yeah. You didn't die of, like, getting a tooth And it was also about making sure, like, the sun comes up and everything else. Back into Terry Pratchett. No, that's just general. I know, I know. Um, but the big thing is you've got to remember that Christmas is 12 days. Yes, you were very you were very passionate about that this year. Well, this year just gone. Yeah. Christmas is twelve days. It starts at Christmas Eve and it runs through to the fifth or sixth. Okay? There are Saint Days mixed in with it. There is all sorts, right? Christmas is not a single fucking day and boxing day. It is twelve days. It's not always about God. The twelve days of Christmas haven't or are about they are about religion in the late medieval period the early medieval period it's 12 days of rest yeah. and relaxation and people enjoying it and i feel businesses have missed out on that trick and if people want the world to change they should fight for 12 days off at christmas yeah just well we now kind of... the running joke is rolls royce is that antiquated <laughs> they still give their staff 12 days off at christmas <laughs> <laughs> Master Wheatley yeah. literally finishes Christmas Eve and yeah. doesn't normally go back till the 4th of January. In fairness, at the Will Writing place, um, they closed for two weeks because there's no point, nothing happens. And at the bank... Yeah, um, but you can blame to... capitalism yeah. for the being open. Look, if you, Christmas Day, don't go out for your fucking Christmas dinner. Stay at oh, home and cook. Yeah, Kip, that's... A... I spent 12 years with no fucking Christmases because assholes couldn't be bothered to fucking cook for themselves. And if you can't cook a full meal because you're old or whatever, soup, tinned foods, <laughs> put it in a pan and heat it up. <laughs> You don't need a three-course roast dinner meal every fucking year for Christmas. You did get... Well, it, you kind of... Because we, we went away for my birthday and they... they It was because it's such a posh hotel. They got this, like, deluxe, like, £500. Oh, I got pounds, so indignant over that. £500 per person. 600 dear. Yeah, it was... I know it came to over a £1,000 for two people. 
and that was on Christmas Day, and it was like oh, it was like up to Boxing Day, wasn't it? Was it was the twenty. It was actually four days. Day. Yeah, it was. You got there Christmas Eve, checked in. You well, had, I think they did a variety of well, things, yeah, but, but the, yeah, the, the whole the, point. It was literally yeah. Christmas Eve clocking in, uh, booking in, clocking in. Well, like that's a, the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. people were clocking, clocking in. in on Christmas Eve in terms of the staff, and there would be staff working for four days, so you could enjoy luxury Christmas, not at home, in a beautiful swanky hotel. I get it, I really do. But you know what? You're taking someone away from their family. Stop being greedy. We're humans. We're not robots. There's a lot of angriness comes from being a chef and not having a Christmas for 12 fucking years. And my Christmas day, folks, was going to work Christmas Eve, spending 16 hours on Christmas Eve working my arse off, going home for four hours sleep and getting up and doing another 12 hours on yeah. Christmas day. And then maybe having Boxing Day off if I was lucky. But sometimes I wouldn't. I'd go into Boxing Day and do another 12 hours. And do you know what I would get paid? 90% of the time, my normal rates. See, a lot of people are like, oh, it's fine because they get paid more for doing Christmas. Not all the time. No. The companies are getting worse and are trying to force it more sometimes that you're just being paid your normal wage. They don't figure you deserve to be that. Yeah. And this is the point. The restaurant industry, as a rule, is open 365 days a year. If you can't go to the pub for one day, is it really that big a shame? It's one day. It's not going to kill the pub. No. A whole year, like we've had with COVID, yeah, that might kill a pub. But one day to let everyone have a day off for once in their lives. No, because I agree. half the time, if they do close for one day, you don't even get it as paid holiday. No. They wrote it as just a day off for everyone. See, being a lazy layabout office worker, um, it was the complete opposite in that there was no point using your holiday to book stuff off because nothing happened. Like, I worked for the bank. The bank would shut the bank holidays, then reopen in between. Yeah. So if you had one of those really annoying years where it was like Christmas Eve was Monday, Christmas Day was Tuesday, you'd end up coming in half of Monday off Tuesday, back in Wednesday, a couple of days in, and then bloody New Year's and all that. Yeah. And it was like, but nothing happened. I don't even get me started on that. I literally got sat, I got paid to do a puzzle book. It was ace, because nobody would ring in. Because they all closed for two weeks. And they, they for the personal banking side, they were 24-7. Yeah. So they did used to have to open at Christmas. Yeah. But they paid them an absolute metric fuck ton of money to do it and it was only the and they had a skeleton staff so it was only the people that wanted to like people that didn't care or that didn't have any family they were bothered about seeing or people of a different religion and it was easy money and then they got the time to spend at another time that was more important to them but for catering it's not like, like that at I all. literally this is the first like since I met my spooky goth wife <laughs> my Christmases have truly got better Oh. No, because it's like I've actually been able to spend time with family and be around family at Christmas and actually do stuff in a Christmas family fashion. Because I generally, I, I reached a point where I actually liked Christmas. Yeah. And then the catering industry killed that for me because newsflash people, you start planning Christmas in July. Yeah. Well, you think people start doing Christmas parties in September. So for you to have a Christmas party menu in September... You've got to do the work in July. Yeah. We used to have to go to a Christmas road show. Okay. Oh, God, that sounds awful already. Yeah, it's to do with (laughs) menu launches and everything. And you had to wear a Christmas jumper. Oh, no. In August. No. In August. Oh. Now... You need therapy. Now, as you can see, like, it's August. It's... 34 degrees, for example, and you've got to wear a Christmas jumper. And guess what? You're not allowed to take it off. That's evil. Because you seem to, you've got to be on brand all the time. The team spirit. Yeah. Let's all this sweat This is the problem. So when I rock up wearing a Grinch one, I got told to take it off and they would find a replacement one. I went, no. It's Christmas themed. Yeah. But they were like, oh, but the Grinch is anti-Christmas. I went, yeah, for good reason. <laughs> I bet they'd have loved your Punisher one that you've got now. <laughs> With the skulls on it. 
that's not Christmas gift. It's got snowflakes on it. I think yeah. you'll find that's legitimately Christmas. Yeah. It's in the Norwegian style of knitwear. It's got snowflakes. Kieran, it's also got a really great skull on it and a load of other skulls. Yes, but that's still Christmassy. You can it still is have the festive death, skulls. It is the death of the year yeah. and the rebirth. Yeah. Yeah, I can get around. I can spin bullshit. Right, so when you read a menu... Because we will keep on the food theme, but we'll yeah. talk a bit about me as a chef. When you read a menu and it says rustic, okay, <laughs> generally what that means is they've burnt it slightly and they can't be <laughs> asked to correct the situation. <laughs> I haven't bothered to peel the vegetable. Yeah. Literally, if they say rustic, it generally means in some respects that they're talking about they're being lazy and they can't be asked to peel anything. So they'll give it a good old scrub clean, chop it up, cook it and be done. And that's Rustic. Um, it, it, nine tenths of chefing sometimes is the art of bullshitting a menu to be able to spin. I think this is the thing that makes me laugh. There's been like all these TikTok videos and it's like people that work at McDonald's and they're like, this is what the burger sauce looks like. And it's like, blah, 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 like pouring out in a, out of a giant yeah. industrial yeah. tub and everybody's like, oh, it's like, it's what industrial did you expect? cooking, you idiot. <laughs> it's like you go to Weatherspoons and the third the food turns up in five minutes. Do you honestly think they've been there like like finely slicing herbs that have just come out of a garden? If it requires no 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 no, no, no. Industrial level catering in spoons and any big restaurant like that, I'm not gonna lie, folks, unless it's a steak, it might have been prepped and cooked that morning. But it'll have been chilled down, portioned up, and it'll have gone through a microwave to go back on your plate. Yeah. They might cook it fresh, but they won't be cooking it fresh to order at times unless you're paying almost £55 a head. Yeah, 100%. And that's for a single course meal with, like, we're talking, you if you're paying 30 odd quid for one meal in yeah. terms of one yeah, dish. Yeah, your individual dish. Yeah. Per head, if you're looking for truly fresh food, you're normally looking at about £120 a head. Yeah. Okay? Now, you consider we had a beautiful... Yes, uh, when I went away for my birthday. We had that lovely three-course meal yeah. that wasn't the a la carte £55 a head, but about £55 a head is right for an a la carte because you've only got a limited selection. Yeah, so, so they don't you, they, have you to. don't need to... No, but... They can, they can make it fresh, but they're only having to deal with, like, four starters, four mains, four desserts. Now, you think those burgers were freshly made. Oh, God, yeah. They were beautiful. Okay. The brownie we had for pudding, though... Yeah. ...was not... No. I'm not going to disparage them. It was nice. It was beautiful, but I would put... Generally, I would stake my reputation slightly on saying the brownie was probably not freshly made by yeah. them. It was probably something industrially bought yeah. and portioned up. Oh, my God. My life changed when um, good old Uncle Nige lent us the booker's card. And we went. And Your I eyes were open I to found the industrial out, world. I found out where the fudge cake comes from that they serve in all the, the cheap pubs. The, the fudge cake with the white... Oh! And you can buy whole ones the size of Bruce Bogtrotter's cake. And that's just like, my life has changed. You can't fit them in the freezer. You don't need to if you eat them all in one go. Yes. <laughs> I still remember your face when I came back from Heron Foods with that five litre tub of Ben and Jerry's. And you were like, we don't fit it in the freezer. I was like, yes, I will. <laughs> And I did. And she <laughs> ate it all herself. Yeah, over months months uh, for one i couldn't chisel into the bastard thing no, it was too hard <laughs> <laughs> was a breeze block of ice you cream no, you can't like leave it on the side like the little tubs yeah. it was like you like leave a it trough. on the side it was for like, like a trough 20 minutes to soften enough you could scrape the top inch off yeah and then put it back in the it freezer was, a bit. It, somehow yeah. heron foods had got their hands on the industrial ones that they normally have in the actual ice cream things but anyway yeah, four and a half litres of Ben and Jerry she came back to the house with. That's a great achievement. I had to fucking rearrange my entire freezer just to fit it in for her. <laughs> he hates me going in the kitchen. He absolutely hates it. It's like... Once a <laughs> chef, always a chef. <laughs> I'll be there peeling the potato and I'll just hear <sighs> from behind me. Learn to peel them properly then. It's not hard. It's a potato. I, I still peel the potato. I just don't do it in the way that you deem fit. Well, 
Yes. It's fine. <laughs> it's me and kitchens. And this is the whole point to some degree of talking about food this evening and Vike cooking is I've spent quite a long time catering um, for my own group. Yeah. I'm... I've also cooked... So, for those of you in the Vike Society who are listening into this, I have cooked two banquets for this yeah, society. The full, the full tiers. Okay. And the first one was done and was what it was. The first one you genuinely right. volunteered. The second right. one you got no. conscripted. I wasn't conscripted. You I were. did volunteer. Um, <laughs> I volunteer as tribute. Yeah. <laughs> but what makes Fliss slightly weird, well, it doesn't weird her out, but what impresses my wife to some degree and it just makes me chuckle is the fact that the first one we did was way back in the mists of time and i don't even remember what year it was i wasn't there so it was during my hermit year i think but uh, it must have been about 2012 i think 2011 2012 i think 2012 as a rule because i'm sure it was 2012 and i did that one and then in 2018 i did a second one but the second one was entertaining because um, someone asked if I would be doing any authentic style courses, to which I promptly turned around and went, no. Um, and the whole menu was pretty simplistic. Um, I did two soups. I did a mushroom and a tomato soup for yeah. starters. I did a roast chicken and uh, roasted potato with vegetable yeah, that was second nice. course. And that was a half roast chicken per person. Um, I did uh, a, a, a mutton tagine and a vegetable tagine yep. for the third course. And I did either a cheese board or a fruit salad for your dessert. Because I don't hold with sweet puddings a lot of well, the time. Also, you were cooking the damn thing on your own. Yes. Now, this is what impresses my <laughs> wife. is the fact that I catered for 200 people and did all the cooking by myself in one for the banquet in a day. In two quite small kitchens, yeah, quite yeah. contentedly. He started off in one and then had to move everything downstairs to a second kitchen that was slightly bigger. And I mean, the, my only claim to fame can be that we, I helped you chop vegetables the night before. And some in the morning. But that's all I can say that that I really did. Now, if I had been in that situation, I would have cried and gone and changed my name and gone to another country. Because... No. But the reason partly for this podcast we're talking about food and what's required in terms of early medieval cuisine and the herbs and spices to some degree and the fact that things like rosemary thyme, blah, 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 we don't have as much access to other herbs and spices as you do in the later medieval period is because Dane Law has got a load of new folks. Now, one of those folks is a uh, very tall, very skinny 17-year-old who is just qualifying at becoming a chef, bless him. And him and his mum are very keen on period cuisine cooking. They've got the How to Eat Like a Viking cookbook done by, I think it's Craig Brooks, and he's part of Yepper's group, I think. I can never remember what the Yepper's group's called. Well, there's one of Yepper's shield, like the group's Yepper's shield group colours are in the picture, as it were, and stuff. Mm. But he's done a lot of work as well. Um, They've got that cookbook, and they've been working their way through all the recipes in that. Uh, and what it means is more just like, I'm looking to pass the baton on at last. Well, because you're from, having to be an authenticity person. More Well, I, I more, not that I've, I've always been an authenticity person. No, I just, but you're actually but having I, to go to meetings. Well, and... I'm not. I could quite happily ignore meetings and not bother and just remain an authenticity person for the group and do what I like. Um, but So now I, <laughs> in his wisdom... He's pushing for me, to, I think, eventually to become a certified authenticity thing, which is fair enough. Now, I would like to be a cat in some respect, but I've always enjoyed just kind of plodding around camp and cooking because it kind of keeps me busy on the weekend. And it's always been a lot of fun for me because it kind of lets me be a chef again without all the added stressors and everything else. Um, so I suppose part of me is just wondering what I'm actually going to do at weekends because being a cat doesn't take up that much time. Well, we'll see because there's going to be loads of people that need authenticating. But this is the whole point. Like, but people haven't been coming for, like, we've been offering online kit checks and people haven't come to them. So yeah. we've had one or two. Um, but, like, cuisine and getting the menus right is just, 
this is why I'm really looking forward to like Katie and Lex and Rachel and me and like there's actually not just me now trying to do everything. Yeah. And it's like there's actually going to be a kitchen team for Dane Law by the look of it. Well, we and bloody need one. We will. But we can look at actual like organising proper menus for the whole weekend in terms of we're going to do this. Yeah, I'm just going to wrap it up there because why the hell not? It's about time. It's an hour It's about time. Yeah. It's that time of the evening. Well, if you're listening and you're coming to the training weekend, we will see you. Yes. If you have any recommendations for things that you want us to talk about or not talk about, then we can talk about them anyway. Yeah, we'll talk about them anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Like and subscribe and tell your friends and tell other people that might be crazy enough to listen to us and all that good stuff. And we'll see you later. Yes, yes we will. Bye, everybody! Bye!